vibrant and thriving commercial environment is an important linchpin for every community, no less for Harlem, which has suffered its ups and downs through the years. Today's urban agenda will explore what's ahead for the community which is at the heart of African American culture and history. I'm David R. Jones, President of the Community Service Society of New York. My guest is Deborah C. Wright, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Upper Manhattan Empowerment Zone Development Corporation. With a BA, Law, and MBA degrees from Harvard, Ms. Wright has previously served both the Dinkins and Giuliani administrations. Her most recent city post was as Commissioner for the Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development. Deborah, is, is Harlem now right on the way up? It's going to rival, you know, Times Square or wherever. It's, it's an important time, and I think the analogy to Times Square hasn't been lost on a lot of people. Right. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, people have short memories. They don't, they don't realize it took 20 years for Times Square to be where it is today. Right. But the benefit for us uptown is as people focus on just an explosion in retail and entertainment uses, uh, those who feel closed out price-wise at Times Square are now calling us, which is great. Well, well, tell us and tell the audience something about how this whole project, the Empowerment Zones, got off the ground. I think people have heard it in passing, but... But don't know what it is. is uh, right. Well, it's a Clinton initiative. Uh, in fact, some would say the, the premier and only uh, urban agenda uh, nationwide, and there are nine Empowerment Zones across the country. It was fiercely fought for in a competition, and as you know, our own Congressman Rango led the fight to get the Empowerment Zone legislation through Congress, a uh, bipartisan effort that's been uh, attempted for well over a decade, but he pushed it through in 1993. Um, the competition ended up picking nine uh, uh, zones, and six of them are urban in New York City, uh, won one of those uh, coveted positions. It's basically a combination of tax incentives and cash grants which are supposed to be a catalyst for private investment. And I think the thing that's unique about New York is that the state and the city actually match the $100 million grant from, from the federal government. Mm -hmm. So uptown and in the South Bronx, we have uh, $300 million to spend uh, over the next eight years uh, through the year 2004. Um, and there are uh, a number of tax incentives, including most importantly, a credit for each employee that you mm -hmm. hire from the empowerment zone area. Now, this is this is different from the so-called enterprise zones, which were uh, smaller, uh, uh, smaller amount of money, three million dollars or so. That was all the enterprise That's zones all, had. That's all, and uh, and some tax incentives, but not as great as the empowerment zone. So this is a much greater investment uh, on Absolutely. behalf of all the governmental Absolutely. bodies. Absolutely, it's not it's not uh, much compared to the need. Um, but it is a great start, and our hope is that once we can show around the country that these are successful, uh, that the program will be expanded. Yeah, as a Brooklynite, you know, we're, we're sort of watching with great, <laughs> uh, great interest, obviously, as you go along. Indeed. But we've also heard, I think most of the people in New York have heard everything from Walt Disney to uh, all sorts of big stores, at least mm -hmm. talking to uh, you at the Empowerment Zone about what, what is the prospects of, of those major projects going forward? Well, it's amazing. I mean, uh, we, uh, frankly, are uh, just happily shocked at the level of persistent interest by mainstream uh, retailers and other users. Um, it's no surprise when you really peel back some of the stereotypes uh, of the community and you look at the core strengths, which we can talk about a little later, it makes perfect sense. But uh, the board at the Empowerment Zone uh, locally as well as the statewide organization, New York Empowerment Zone Corporation, last week approved our first 10 projects. And one of them was Harlem, USA, which is a 275,000 square foot retail complex, which will include Disney, Cineplex, Odeon, uh, hopefully Barnes & Noble, HMV, um, and The Gap. And these are places that obviously African Americans and Latinos are spending a great deal of money uh, at right now, below 96th Street, but uh, those Class A 
services and, and retail goods are not available uptown. I know one of the community concerns has been with these big projects of how much of the equity and, and monies in these projects will actually recirculate mm -hmm. in the community. How, mm -hmm. how have you dealt with this issue? Because obviously... Yeah, this is a very, it's a tough one. I mean, yeah. uh, obviously the first priority uh, of the legislation was to create jobs. Uh, unemployment uptown is north of 18 percent, which is over twice the city's rate of unemployment, which, as you know, is is about 30 percent greater than the country right. as a whole. And so uh, a priority is job creation, and you've got to obviously invest in some large projects if you're going to move that curve uh, significantly at, at, at all. The Harlem USA project right. is projected to create 700 jobs. 500 of them will be permanent. Um, at the same time, uh, we obviously have a huge uh, responsibility towards wealth creation as well because, as mm -hmm. you know, you can't have successful, sustainable communities unless some of the wealth remains and recirculates in the community. And this is a tougher issue because the weakness of the private sector uptown is something that's going to require a lot of investment, not just in terms of capital, but also technical assistance. Over 43 percent of the jobs uptown are in the, the uh, not-for-profit and government um, spheres. And that number citywide is about 27 percent. So you can see we've got a lot of our eggs in, in one or two baskets, which right. needs to change. Um, one of the first things that the Empowerment Zone did was open the Business Resource Center, yeah, I want to explain which that. is at yeah. 125th and St. Nicholas, right above uh, the Dwayne Reed store right. for, for those who are interested. Um, and we're spending um, uh, three quarters of a million dollars to operate that center. The purpose of it is to get those folks in the community who've had a great idea all these years and never had some place to go centrally to both map out a business plan as well as to get prepared to go to a bank or to a venture capitalist for capital. We're also putting in a half million dollars in capital to bridge the gap between financeable deals uh, with traditional bank standards um, and those projects where you may need an extra cushion or a guarantee or something. But it's a wonderful facility. There's a library there. The state of the art has six computers that are connected to the internet as well as how-to manuals uh, provided by the SBA of every business uh, from starting a daycare uh, center at home to, uh, you know, some high-tech media business. Um, but this is the kind of facility, I think, that can help bridge the gap between those folks who just haven't been able to get their idea off the ground or those who want to expand their businesses mm -hmm. and need some technical assistance. So at the, the, the brisk, there'll be people who can actually take you step by step mm -hmm. in terms of putting together a business plan. Absolutely. Even if you're I, I guess one of the other issues that, that comes up uh, is what will the jobs that are actually created? You talked about mm -hmm. 500 jobs. Would they? What, what's the incentive mm -hmm. to have people hired from inside the, the Harlem community? Mm -hmm. Well, a couple of things. Harlem USA, for example, right. is uh, a luxurious situation relative to most in the sense that there's a locally based not-for-profit group that owns the land that Harlem USA is going to be built on. So not only will they own the land and be the landlord for this project, they also have a significant equity interest, mm -hmm. which is unusual, frankly, for most of the community development efforts around the country. That's first. They obviously have a stake in the community and are going to insist that those jobs be focused on local people. But we're not just depending on goodwill. All of the projects that we fund will have a requirement that people start at home in terms of employing people. And third, they'll have a, a powerful incentive because the tax credit um, that was provided by the federal government is worth 3000 bucks a person um, through the year 2004. Um, for low margin businesses like retail and, and uh, movie theaters, that kind of thing, um, that can be more than the margin uh, typically experienced on a, on, a, on a bottom line basis. So with those three things, you know, forcing and insisting that there are local players um, involved um, second, we're going to tie those, uh, those grants and loans and equity investments that we make as a corporation. Legally, we're going to tie those to that kind of an emphasis, uh, specific targets for people to meet in terms of local participation. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and finally, the tax credit is, a, is the carrot to go with the stick. What, what about the supply side of this issue? There, there's been an issue, obviously, about how particularly young people in central Harlem and Bedford-Stuyvesant, where I come from, mm -hmm. do they have requisite skills, really, mm -hmm. to hold these jobs? Mm -hmm. uh, how are we going to be approaching from the empowerment, you know, the supply side? Can mm -hmm. we actually supply, supply job-ready uh, right. young people and others right. uh, for these new businesses? Well, it's a catch, too, 22. Um, uh, the workforce, uh, just in sheer numbers, could be viewed as a huge asset. Right. Um, have, however, 48% uh, uh, of the working age population is not working, um, and largely that has to do with uh, the official unemployment rate as well as those folks who are out of the workforce altogether. 51% um, of the folks in that working age population don't have a high school diploma. And so obviously the big challenge is getting those people work ready. Um, we have some initiatives w which will roll out in the next few months, probably first of the year, around training. And we've been scouring the city and the country for state-of-the-art practices in this area. As you know, uh, David, Workforce training has been around since the beginning of time, and a lot of people would say it's not the most successful mm -hmm. thing that, that government has attempted to do. Um, but there's some new models that are out there that have been ranked uh, quite high in terms of getting jobs to people and retaining them. And the model seems to be focused on linking up with industry um, and training people towards specific jobs and, and, and industry positions, mm -hmm. um, particularly if you can identify those that are growing. A lot of the job proposals, or the, the workforce development proposals that we've seen are training people for jobs that, that were obsolete a decade ago. And so we'll probably pick three uh, models and uh, experiment with all three, um, one in East Harlem, one in Washington Heights, and one in Central Harlem. Talking from your prior experience as mm -hmm. HPD commissioner, right. um, we uh, we at CSS and the audience um, recognize that there are major changes uh, going on in terms of uh, housing subsidies, mm -hmm. and this is particularly important, ob obviously, up in Harlem, with the devolution of, of HUD uh, and the loss of deep subsidy programs to build new housing. Uh, how will there, as as you uh, work on the empowerment zone side. Are we mm -hmm. running up against uh, someone who's uh, pulled the plug on the other side and going to just as seriously destabilize the Harlems and the South Bronxes of the world? How will the housing, how will this all intersect together? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a frightening time, actually. I mean, uh, not just housing, obviously, welfare, welfare. reform. And, and you think about uh, the impact on local bodegas and grocery stores and other uh, basic staples that depended on food stamps and, right. and uh, those kind of expenditures. Um, when you have welfare reform, so to speak, and, and cut um, job training by a third at the same time, it doesn't make me feel confident about the prospects. But I think it's very difficult to map out um, how all of those changes will take place right. uh, at one time and the net effect on the community. Um, Paradoxically, if we had had four or five years head start on the empowerment zone and some of those positive initiatives, maybe we wouldn't, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be as be fearful. Yeah. Um, but it's uh, kind of the old cross of uh, trying to reinvent as you cut, uh, which I have a lot of experience <laughs> with. What about the, the question of workfare? There's been some discussion about uh, people having to work off their grants and perhaps getting some subsidy to actually private businesses as well. Mm -hmm. Are, is the, uh, the Empowerment Zone going to look at that issue for uh, potential workfare uh, placement? We'd be happy to. I mean, I think uh, when you look at the needs uptown uh, in terms of just basic uh, amenities, clean streets and, um, you know, extra help at, at for-profit places and not-for-profit right. places. Obviously, there are places that people can be used. Um, we haven't had any talks with the administration about that, but, but it's a good idea we should. One of the things that we are linking up with them on is the plan to expand the daycare slots mm -hmm. that are available uptown. Um, and, it, and it's kind of twofold. One is obviously as people move into this new era, they're going to need uh, a place that they feel comfortable leaving their children during the day as they go out and work and, and go to school. 
Um, on top of that, though, there are a lot of women, particularly um, uh, new immigrants, that are interested in having home-based businesses. Um, and uh, we've gotten proposals from people around, um, you know, sewing, cooking, those kind of basic skills, but also around daycare. And we've been talking to a number of the daycare providers who are working with us to, to try to address some of the, the criticisms and concerns about family daycare mm -hmm. um, by perhaps putting in some investment for uh, further training of these women along both child care and educational um, services as well as business skills that they need to be able to get their taxes filled out and get uh, a proper home environment, et cetera. So um, it, it is a uh, bewildering uh, time to see all of, of the structures that we have depended on in terms of support at the bottom level um, appear to just collapse on us. Well, well using that as a jumping off mm -hmm. point beyond the empowerment zone, again mm -hmm. coming back to uh, housing preservation and development in mm -hmm. the city's uh, housing stock, mm -hmm. where do you see it going? I mean, there's, uh, we've had discussions when you were yeah. still commissioner right. about uh, the, the lack of a, the city's ability or the state's ability or certainly now the federal government's ability to come up with new subsidized housing units. Mm -hmm. uh, how will low-income people uh, find adequate housing in the city of New York uh, against a shrinking uh, uh, available stock? Mm -hmm. What do you think the best approaches to this should be? Well, you know, uh, one of the approaches we had was to try to get as many people into uh, home ownership units as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and virtually all of the one to four buildings um, have been put in a, a program, a couple programs to do that. Some focusing on low income families, some working, uh, uh, focusing on uh, working families that are uh, more of a moderate income level. And it's interesting, if you drive through the streets now, you see a lot of those under construction. In mm -hmm. fact, 7,000 units were Start turned out in, in the last, uh, last three years, and another 6,800 units are planned mm -hmm. for the next 24 months. That having been said, as you know, uh, David, as you drive through, um, the hole that we're in uh, is dramatic. Uh, the, the level of vacancy in city ownership of property continues both vacant as well as occupied. Um, without Section 8 subsidies, obviously, uh, we look to tax credits when we were there. Um, and now, as you know, everybody's figured that out, and so tax credits are, are dear and precious as well. Um, ultimately, when you look at, at this crisis, um, it's going to be very difficult for the city alone to fill this big hole. And that's why it's so distressing to see the federal government uh, really moving out of this business because it's, uh, it's something that's very difficult for, for a city administration to carry. One of the signs, obviously, we uh, on the social welfare side are already seeing, obviously, is the return to welfare hotels, mm -hmm. which we thought was a, sort of an artifact of the past, mm -hmm. uh, and obviously people staying overnight in the emergency assistant unit offices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I assume, uh, given the state of money now, that we're going to continue to see some growth in that. It'd be hard uh, uh, not to. I mean, as you know, uh, you saw all of the articles in the New York Times. Right. I think, uh, again, people have short memories. Uh, uh, less than a decade ago, um, HPD had enough money to have 800 code inspectors. You cut, the state legislature cuts out uh, $8 million in one fell swoop, and people don't expect there to be consequences. Right. And so it's sort of odd to hear now um, HBD being blamed or the mayor being blamed. Um, and, you know, we have to decide, I think, as a, as a city, as a state, uh, as a society, whether that's a value we're going we're gonna to invest in. Uh, but we can't sort of dramatically cut something and then go whoops, you know, five or six years later. Well, CSS, as you, know, as you know, did the study, and uh, we're sort of always looking for the from the progressive point of view. Mm -hmm. But we also did some interviews of, of landlords of uh, mm -hmm. low-income uh, premises. And we had found about 140,000 units at risk about two years ago through abandonment to abandonment. And it was clear that one of the stories we kept hearing uh, repeated by landlords is that the revenue and expense balance sheets just weren't working, that mm -hmm. their tenants didn't have enough to meet the basic carrying costs of many of the units, even mm -hmm. the ones that were marginal or submarginal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously with the welfare reform bill going as it did, both uh, in the federal government and potentially in the state, that there may be even less money for people to pay. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that, that basic uh, uh, issue of what poor tenants can pay is uh, not going to go away, right. and, uh, and it's also uh, an area where you cannot expect the private sector to make up the difference. Um, but one of the things that um, has been striking in terms of reading and getting up to speed on the right. community, at least in Harlem, is the lack of uh, investment in those buildings. And yeah. Eighty percent of the buildings were built before 1920. Mm -hmm. And if you don't invest, I mean, you know this, uh, the buildings will continue to decline, and therefore the cost of running them um, will outstrip even market rates. Right. And so uh, coaxing the banks back in, one of, the, one of the things I hope will happen with this resurgence um, in retail growth that's really uh, being spurred by the fact that even though there are people who are poor uptown, it's a lot of them. Right. Um, the density is, is enormous. Um, we'd be the 22nd largest city in the country if we were a city. Um, but I hope that the values uh, will be there such that uh, the banks will be convinced and the insurance companies will be convinced to come back in. And I hope, obviously, it doesn't lead to a increase in the and, gentrification. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think we there is a potential, obviously, of gentrification mm -hmm. not, uh, as middle class come back into the neighborhood, mm -hmm. uh, pushing the, the costs of uh, low-income rental housing just through the roof. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And clearly, a landlord will begin to invest, but want to have a new mix of tenants. Mm -hmm. So, well, you know, this is our, our, our long-standing debate over uh, uh, having a balanced economy and a balanced uh, uh, tenancy. Right. And uh, I think uh, home ownership is one of the few protections against that. And uh, the TIL program uh, has been booming in the last couple of years, and that will protect some of the folks that are already in. But um, that new stock, will, there will be some risk there. Yeah. Well, let's get back to the empowerment zone again. Yeah. What, what do you see on the horizon? What, what new uh, uh, projects seem to be interesting, without perhaps mentioning their exact names, because <laughs> we'll get into trouble. I, by the way, in terms of uh, 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 public disclosure, am on the empowerment zone board uh, um, and uh, work on one of some of the committees. Well, we, we think the future is, is just enormous. I mean, when you start, we talked about assets earlier and, right. and starting first with the density of the community and the fact that retailers are starting to, to figure that out. Um, so obviously that's going to uh, have tremendous impact on the community in terms of uh, beautifying commercial strips and, and getting those functioning. Second thing people don't think about very much is that there are six major institutions uptown, uh, mainly health careers based, uh, Mount Sinai, Columbia Presbyterian, North General mm -hmm. Hospital, Harlem Hospital, as well as uh, universities that are world renowned, and trying to get those institutions to uh, reconnect to the community, if you will, and spend some of those dollars uh, um, uptown is, is something that's going to be a major focus. And last but not least, um, tourism, I know it's kind of an old song, but it has really um, kept New York City's economy afloat as well as uh, many other major cities in the country. And if you think about uh, Harlem's distinctive competence, that's got to be it. It's culture and it's history. But you got to invest in that infrastructure. If you don't have a bed and breakfast, if you don't have um, streets that people feel comfortable shopping on, if you don't have uh, souvenir shops where people can get off the bus and spend some money right. uptown, then it doesn't have the kind of economic impact that it should. Well, what about one of the interest, the things that people are constantly talk about with, with Central Harlem, the, the fear of crime? Right. How, how is the empowerment zone going to cope with those issues? Well, it's interesting. When you look at the stats, uh, the crime uptown has declined at a greater percentage uh, than the city as a whole mm -hmm. over the last three years. And most of the crimes are crimes of passion between people who really know each other. Right. So. Again, back to perception and reality, but um, it's going to take a major effort, obviously, with the police department to solidify the commercial corridors. Uh, one of the ten projects we're investing in right away is a community court, which we hope will do for Uptown what it did in Midtown. Why don't you explain that? How, how does that work? Uh, it's, a, it's a decentralized court. It uh, has a lot of supporters and, and some detractors, um, but the thing we love about it is that uh, it focuses on quality of life crimes, mm -hmm. uh, non-felonies, like um, 
three card money and prostitution and, and those sort right. of things that are a real nuisance on, on commercial streets. Yep. And they arrest folks and, and they are sentenced either that day or the next day to a, a restitution uh, to the community. So um, uh, you come in, you're sentenced to uh, removing graffiti uh, on a commercial strip right. or, or sweeping or, or helping a not-for-profit stuff envelopes. That's the first part of your sentence. But the second part of your sentence is forcing you to deal with your issue. And uh, you, you leave one floor and you go upstairs to a uh, uh, centralized social service delivery floor. And if your issue is uh, drugs, you get sent to the desk that uh, refers you immediately to a drug treatment center. If your issue is homelessness, um, there's a person there from uh, the homeless agency and, and on and on and on. So, um, and I think that's particularly important to our community uptown dealing with uh, folks in a way that doesn't send, continue to send, send them to a revolving door. Um, Just one closing question. Yeah. What, say it's 2020, I can't even believe I'm talking that far. I'm well into a retirement, you're still in <laughs> mid-career. I hope to be retired yeah. too. <laughs> what do you envision for the place? What do you envision for the empowerment zones and achievements? How, how would you see it? We're, we're not ashamed uh, at the empowerment zone staff. You know we're a little, we're a little ahead of ourselves up right. there, but uh, we're walking around the office saying that uh, Uptown is going to be the urban capital of the world, and we mean that. We think we have all the ingredients to do that. It's already the biggest draw for African Americans and uh, uh, Latinos around the world. We just got to give them a reason to come there, stay there, spend their money. Um, and obviously, uh, we hope that as much of that money is going to recirculate in the community as possible. Thank you very much, Deborah. Thank you. Visitors from around the world flocked to Harlem, but its own residents for too long had little to feel good about. Now, for the first time in decades, there is hope in Harlem. Mainstream companies are competing for the sites and the community, seeking to tap its huge market of consumers. With new stores comes new jobs. There is a growing excitement that, once again, Harlem is the place to be. This is David R. Jones. Thank you for joining us on The Urban Agenda. To comment on the Urban Agenda or for more information on CSS, contact Community Service Society of New York, 105 East 22nd Street, New York, New York, 10010, area code 212-254-8900.